Thank you, Ron. It's great to be here, and I think I may be distinguished in this group as being the only person who knew both Paul Wilging and Eric Dion well. Um, and, and I think this is really a terrific, terrific match. So I knew Paul when he emerged from one of his several retirements, and he was recruited to join the faculty in the Division of Geriatric Medicine at Johns Hopkins, and he was put into the group that I supervised, the Geriatric Health Services Research Group, and he was given an office just next door to mine. And Paul's um, imprint on our group was manifest by basically his always telling us pointy head academic eggheads to be practical. <laughs> Make sure that the work that you're doing has some ability to actually improve the life of older people. And sometimes the distance between what we do and the ability to actually make that change it can, it can be a little bit long. But Paul was just great at constantly goading us to think about the real world. Um, I, I think it's really a perfect link to the work that Eric does. I've known Eric for just about 20 years now. I knew him when he was a resident at Hopkins, then a geriatrics fellow, then a member of our faculty at Hopkins. He was distinguished then by his uh, incredible dedication to teaching, uh, teaching students, teaching others, his uh, ability to be a master, truly a master clinician, and uh, all along the way doing important research and important work. Uh, when he was a junior faculty person, he actually led the development of an innovative service delivery model where he got the orthopedic surgeons and the geriatric medicine doctors to actually work together to take care of people who had fractured their hip or undergoing orthopedic surgery kinds of procedures. And that was really a very novel concept at the time. It's a model that's replicated uh, around the country. Um, he, uh, he, he then left Hopkins and went down to Washington because he had a vision that we really weren't serving older adults who were home limited because of their multiple chronic conditions and inability to get out of the home. So he took a model that we had developed at Hopkins and really took it down to DC where he turned it really into a world-class model. Uh, it's a, he's, he's been a national leader in that. He's been able to parlay his model into the basis for legislation that made its way into the Affordable Care Act, which I'm sure he'll tell you about uh, during his presentation. Uh, I, I think he really um, demonstrates what's best in geriatric medicine, honoring patients and families, really bringing the best in care to the bedside, always thinking about the patient first, an ability to link what he does with the real world, whether it be business models or policy development uh, or the like. Uh, I know that Paul would be very honored to see Eric give this lecture, were that possible? He knew of Eric's work, he really enjoyed Eric's work, and I'm sure that you will as well. So let me introduce to you my good friend, Dr. Eric Dion. Can you hear me? Uh, thanks, Bruce. Uh, thanks uh, to Ron. I'm gonna actually um, start by just highlighting the question that I asked in my first slide. And, you know, I, I thought about, long and hard about the kind of title of this talk, but I decided to use this language for a particular reason. Um, how, how can we keep elders at home? So that assumes that that's a good thing. All right, so, I, so I'm going to give you my bias. I think that is a good thing. It does, it's not always possible, um, but I wanted to kind of uh, give you my take on how we can kind of optimize our chances well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Optimize our chances to keep our elders at home. So a little background about me. Um, so I grew up in Chicago, north side of Chicago. Um, I bounced around through my training, landed in Baltimore, where I kind of um, learned under Dr. Leff and met some geriatricians at Hopkins who really inspired me to kind of pursue the, the field of geriatrics. And I, I want to kind of acknowledge Renee and Dolly who are going into geriatrics and aging and encourage all of you. It's a really cool field. A lot of people think that elder care and geriatrics is, is uh, you know, just kind of about taking care of folks in nursing homes and it's not, that's part of it, but it's, it, it, there's a lot of other inspiring things about going into geriatrics. So I was inspired to go into geriatrics because the patients are kind of some of the most challenging, complex, 
and interesting patients that I met. And the docs who I saw learning to take care of them were um, taking care of them in a way that um, I felt like I could grow personally kind of throughout my life as a, as a physician. So, in, and I'm gonna tell you my story you know, through our program that we've set up in DC. Before I start, I do wanna um, um, kind of highlight a couple of people in the room. Jenna Crawley and Julie Beecher who are right there in the fourth row. You guys just raise your hands. And Hirsch next to them is our medical student. It's our chief social worker and our director of operations who are here to give me some moral support. Um, I want to recognize uh, Kirsten and Monica uh, Wilging, who are the family of uh, Paul, who I, who I never met, but who, uh, who are here today. Ron Carlson and the team here at the Howard Community College. I think it's really remarkable how the endowment and the college are kind of combining to you know, produce new workforce uh, for geriatrics. Bruce and Chris Durso and the geriatrics group, and then the award winners who you've already met today. Um, this is a little, what I do know about Paul, and I've learned a lot more about him just today, is um, you know, he lived 69 very full years. I was surprised that, to hear that he died at the age of 69 because he, might, he accomplished much more than what someone who lived to just 69 would have accomplished. Um, he died in May 2011 after his third battle with cancer. Um, what I hear about him is that he was a very affable, good-hearted man, and I kind of thought this quote was great. I think Bruce told me this. He was always a contributor. No matter what he was in, he made sure that he made the most of it. He was always a contributor. contributor. He was a leader in a variety of kind of arenas throughout his career of the American uh, Home Health Care Association, Assisted Living kind of association nationally, HICFA, which is now CMS, but he, he led the Medicare Medicaid department um, um, years ago, and then very active in the Howard County community. He was a great teacher. He spoke his mind, which I will try to uh, uh, follow through on, and he ended with a joke, so we will do that too. Um, his mission, which actually is a lot echoes the mission that I have, was to really improve the quality of care for vulnerable seniors, um, apply his academic learnings to the real world. So you can't just think about it and talk about it, you have to go out and do it. And I'm gonna to try to tell you what we're doing to try to you know, kind of follow his lead. Um, and then his scholarship opportunity is really to try to create workforce. So what workforce is needed to take care of the folks that we're gonna talk about. Um, I was really struck on the website for Howard Community College that you have 14,000 students. Is that about right, Dave? 30,000. Okay, so 30,000 students. Wow. Um, and, and the kind of one tagline from the website is to discover the greatness in yourself and in others. Actually, I thought that really echoed what geriatrics is about, is that, and that as we take care for elders or work with elders, we can discover the greatness in them um, as well as in ourselves as we do this. So here are the five questions I'm going to try to cover. Why? First of all, is it even important for elders to stay at home? And I'm going to say part of your job today is to ask questions. I want you to ask questions and kind of try to answer some of these questions as we go through. Because I'm not going to talk for 60 minutes. We're going to finish by 3.30, but I hope at least half of that is kind of taking questions and having a good discussion. What are the challenges to keeping elders at home? You know, what gets in the way of accomplishing that goal? Um, what is possible if you actually do it? What can you actually do? What is possible to do out in the community that you might not even imagine? What does it take to do it? So there's what is possible, and then what does it take every day, whether it's people, money, organization, family, what does it take to actually truly keep elders in the center of the community, as we talked about at lunch, and in their own homes? And finally, what are the key next steps? So why is it important? And then kind of walk through a little bit about um, how it actually works. And then what are some next steps to, that we could take? So the patients I'm going to generally talk about are elders. And sometimes people argue with me about using that term. I actually like the term elders. Older adults is used a lot for folks probably down to 50. And I just turned 50. And, and I'm, I'm OK being an older adult. Um, but when I get even older, I'd be okay being an elder. Elders, I, I think of it as the wisdom of elders and respecting our elders. And elders in the community have the most to kind of give and, and to receive from the community. So I, I actually still use that word, although it's a little bit out of vogue. Um, these are folks, though, with serious chronic disabling illness. I'm not going to talk about the folks like President George H.W. Bush, who was jumping out of airplanes when he was 85. I'm going to talk about folks who, who need a lot of support and need a lot of care in the community. How do we keep them at home? 
They tend to be aged really 70s, although that's getting more and more rare for L geriatric patients to really be in their 70s, up to 111. My patient just passed away. We'll talk about who was um, you know, 111 and 3 quarters. But the median, the average age, tends to be 85, 86 in our practice. They have all sorts of illnesses. They have dementia. They have arthritis. Um, they have kind of heart failure, stroke, cancer, blindness. All the organ systems, on some level, are at risk for illness. So these are folks with multiple illnesses. That leads, then, to functional and cognitive disability. So I'm going to talk about this population that is complex, has a lot of illness, has some sort of often functional cognitive disability, but are still very valuable both to their family and to the community in which they live. So these are kind of the most ill, most in need, happen to be the highest cost patients in Medicare. So 5% of the Medicare population expends about 50% of the Medicare budget. So 5% of the patients, 50% of the budget. The numbers this past year in FY14, Medicare was about $560 billion in the Medicare budget. So this small group expends about $270 billion of the federal budget. So it has a tremendous impact on kind of the resources that the country has. Um, but this is actually the kind of patients that this is. This is one of my nurse practitioners on the right, her home health, the home health aide in the center. And actually, Miss Julie, uh, you know, uh, who's the patient on the right. Um, you can see, by, if you look at this picture a little bit, and some of the details are kind of cool. You know, so she's in, she's in a hospital bed. You can see there's a hospital bed. Her medicines are next to the bed. She's really well, well kept. She has an aide next to her. She has our nurse practitioner visiting. Um, so really, you know, it's a, it's a nice sen sense of the kind of teamwork that it takes to keep her safe at home. But that's the kind of folks that we're going to be thinking about and talking about. So why is it important to keep elders at home? So I'm going to separate into two kind of uh, categories. One is the human reasons. And I kind of list them here. But it's, it's worth taking a minute to really respect the values and dignity of that person, to have them live where they want to live to maintain kind of family unity and to share the wisdom, both from younger generations to older and, and back. And then to, I think, face aging and death together. I think there, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, there's a lot of sense that, you know, we're gonna stay young forever and we don't wanna really face the fact that people are aging or that people die. And I actually think it's really healthy for us to, as families, as a community, face that process of aging in all its vitality and then as, as our lives end together. There's societal reasons. Um, we want, I think we want to preserve the integrity of the community, and that includes all generations, whether they be young, middle-aged, elderly, or disabled, or others. We want to, I think we want to keep the elders in full view um, so that we know they're a valuable part of the community and that they, if they have needs, that we aren't ignoring them. And finally, the fiscal responsibility is, a, is an issue I think the kind of ethical and human reasons probably are predominant in my mind. But Medicare and Medicaid dollars together, which is just a portion of what is spent on, on care of elders, is about $900 billion. Um, it, Dr. Uh, President Obama said early in his ter first term that it's the number one threat to federal resources and kind of doing anything else with the federal budget for other kind of um, services. Um, I actually think it's the good, there's really good news here. Because when you actually look at the budget, there's plenty of money to care for the current population and the future population. Um, the, the reason that's good, the, that news is good is that we're, we're actually wasting a tremendous amount of money the way we currently do it. So when, when we're going to get to some data, but there's probably 20% of that budget that is either harmful or, or wasteful in, in terms of the care that we're currently giving. And so I'm going to propose kind of a different way of thinking about care of elders that makes us have a lot of extra uh, room in that budget. So these are some of the challenges. And I'm going to stop in a minute. And I, was, I want you to start thinking about what do you think are some of the challenges to keeping elders at home? Because I'm going to ask you in a minute for your ideas. Um, these are kind of the cultural and human challenges. Um, I think there is some, to some degree, a cultural denial about the aging process and end of life care. And that it's sometimes a little more convenient for us to have elders be segregated or off living in a different place, whether it's a nursing home or a senior community or assisted living. And, and uh, 
Actually, I always get a kick out of the assisted living company, which does a lot of great work in, around the D.C. Alton area. It's called Sunrise. You know, so there's, some, there's just some irony there that, that it doesn't need to be called Sunset. You don't have to call it Sunset. But it seems, it seems it takes a little bit of chutzpah to call it Sunrise. I mean, I think, um, so, so it, it gets to that idea that there is some denial of the fact that this process is occurring and that we need to be, work together to kind of face that. Another big challenge is that when it comes right down to it, day to day, there's a need for some sort of devoted family at home. It, can, it doesn't have to be relative, blood relative, but for this population who are at risk of losing their home, there needs to be some sort of devoted person, a you know, incredibly loyal neighbor or friend, oftentimes it's family. That can be a challenge. There's right now negative financial incentives for doing home-based care. That may change a little bit, but by and large, there's positive incentives to get people to the emergency room, to admit them to the hospital, to admit them to the nursing home, to do specialty procedures. But there is a lot of negative incentives to doing home-based care because it's hard to do. You have to do travel time. The reimbursement for home-based care is actually relatively low within Medicare. That's a real challenge. What all this does then, between the culture, perhaps so, the social situation not being um, uh, strong, the financial incentives, it kind of pushes elders into expensive and relatively high risk institutions, the hospital and the nursing home. I, I use that word high risk intentionally, because when an elder person goes to the hospital, when they're sick, acutely sick, and they face the stressors and risks of the hospital, sometimes we fix the problem they came in with but they come out much worse. So hospitals are dangerous places at times. They're also great places, but they have a, there's a lot of risks, and the financial incentives are pushing people to be admitted to the hospital, when in fact, and one of the cases I'm gonna present will show, um, there's many uh, negative consequences of going to the hospital. Same, same, in some ways, less so with nursing homes. The hospitals are probably the single most dangerous place to send an elder in the healthcare system. And so you have to use really careful judgment about when you do that, and is there an alternative way of, doing, of taking care of that person. Finally, which gets to kind of the role of a place like Howard Community College, what kind of workforce is needed or is, is present or isn't present to, to help keep elders at home? So those are some of the kind of big picture challenges. I'm going to list a few other um, and a more personal patient challenges. But before I actually I'll do it, I'll, I'll do that. And I'm going to uh, give you this picture. A lot of you saw this article in the New York Times last week, right? Um, fighting to honor a father's last wish to die at home. Um, it was uh, literally uh, a week ago on the 26th of September. I encourage you to check out this link, which is also at the end of my PowerPoint. But if you look at this picture, I, I, my, my face is, my eyes are drawn to the daughter. I mean, how, how does she look? So it's kind of at the end of her rope, right? She's got a headache. She's staring up at the ceiling. Maybe she's looking for, you know, spiritual help. Her dad, who she's really attached to, is, you know, in his hospital bed. They're kind of in limbo. And if you read the story, this is an eight-month process where he said his main wish, because he knew he was dying, was to die at home um, for a variety of reasons through all the healthcare systems he went through in New York City. Um, they, they estimated it costs, not it costs, a million dollars for his eight months of care, and he, and he never was able to achieve that goal. Despite a million dollars, she said, "You think for a million dollars, like we could, you know, we could honor his last wish?" And it, it, it did not finally happen. So, so she kind of went through and faced a lot of the challenges that we just talked about. These are some personal challenges. Some of these are a little bit uncomfortable, and I, it's okay if you're uncomfortable when we read through this list. People get disabled; they can't move. They can't get out of bed. They have, inc they have incontinence. They get confused. These are, again, people who have a lot of serious illness. That doesn't mean that's the totality of their person, but these things are some of the big challenges that they face to keeping someone safely at home. They have very complex illnesses with 10, 15 medicines, all of which could cause side effects. Um, they may have falls or serious safety concerns at home. And the caregivers, who are left often on their own at home, feel great burden and stress. So I'm going to stop for a minute, and I just—I you know, didn't mean this to be an exhaustive list, but I want to have you guys throw out as we go through the next 40, 45 minutes or so. What are some other challenges that you think 
make it hard for elders to stay at home? Accessibility. Accessibility. Say, say a little bit more about that. Be able to go really in the house. Good. Or even just stay into the house. Steps into the house. Good. So steps, and eight steps or 12 steps into the house can be a terrible barrier to people visiting you, but it's much, it's much harder to actually have that person get out. So getting out for health care or, or kind of any kind of socialization. Being able to operate in your house, right? You know, the key things when you're trying to live safely at home is to be able to get to the bathroom, get to food, you know, you know get to other people in the, in the family, get to other rooms in the house. And a lot of uh, you know, architecture is not set up for that. Any other challenges? Any, any, I'm sure that you, you have other thoughts. Renee. Financial. Right, so like what kind of financial barriers? Well, personally, um, I was my father's caregiver. And um, I didn't have a lot of other family support, so I was a sole caregiver. And um, he wasn't completely immobile, but I almost wish he had him because there were a lot of balls. <laughs> um, and if we could have, if, if I could afford to have somebody come in so I could leave the house, because caregivers got to get, you can't, if the caregiver doesn't take care of the caregiver, then you can't give care to the caregiver. So family caregivers need financial support, is what Renee is getting at, that, that without that, it can be too much for a single caregiver if they, need a, if they have a job, if they have any physical or health issues of their own, or if they're just actually exhausted. So you need some support for that family, and it's not something they can do on their own. Jenny. I think the other thing that the caregiver and the family and the consumer needs is access to information about what services are available mm -hmm. Simple, uniform, on 24-7. All right, so, so, so Jenny talked about, so I, I'm here at home with my, my loved one. How do I get the help that I need? Where, where is the list of social or medical or nursing or rehab services, hospice, whatever it is you're looking for, how do I find it? And is there a clear, simple way of finding that, that help? Great. O other challenges that people run into? Yeah? Knowing or remembering or understanding what their challenges are. So I feel like them being at home is supposed to give them more independence to move around, but if they don't always remember or acknowledge the fact that they can't, or that they can't eat certain things for themselves, just to even remember what they're able to do. All right, so the question was about, well, the answer was about that patients who maybe have confusion or dementia, are you thinking of yeah. those kind of folks who, who may not have judgment to do what's safe or correct for their, their health. I do tell a lot of my patients, you know, once, especially once they're over 85, that when I'm 85, I'm gonna eat whatever I want. Um, so I'm not as strict about nutrition um, with folks who are, you know, at that point, but the judgment of dementia patients is a really key issue, is, you know, because it, it creates a lot of fear and anxiety for family members when patients are, don't have the memory or judgment to make safe decisions in the home. And that can be really hard. And the other challenges that you can think of that we haven't touched on. Pam? Another one would be the fear for invasion of privacy, where they're afraid to have a stranger in the house. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so the comment was about that the, the patient or the elder may be afraid of an invasion of privacy of their home. We actually, and I'm talking to Jenna, my social worker is here, we run into a number of patients who say, I don't want some stranger sitting in my house staring at me for eight hours watching TV or, you know, or just waiting for me to fall or waiting for something bad to happen. I don't need that. And, you know, they may not be able to walk or transfer or, or get to the bathroom, but they don't want that stranger in their house. Ron? Discharge planning. What to do, uh, what to know uh, and when to know it. When a, a patient is released from the, the hospital, mm -hmm. what are the things the family must know in order to care adequately for that patient. All right, so the transition home from the hospital is what Ron is mentioning, and, and how do you know you can do a safe discharge from the hospital, and what does a family need to know when they go home? It's a huge problem. There's um, a lot of literature, um, and in the Medicare population, that on, upon discharge from acute hospitals in our country, 25% are readmitted within 30 days. And there's $17 billion of 
much of that is unnecessary or wasted costs because discharge planning doesn't have sustainability. It's not a safe, stable discharge. And the family and the home environment have a huge impact. They're either education and training or lack thereof on whether that happens. Sir? Is the access of the resident or, or the, the elder or their family member to the medical record, having one record for one person across the continuum, if I, before I die, I'd like to see that one. Yeah. You know? because How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, don't have, you, don't have, you don't have to answer that. <laughs> I'm not sure it's going to happen. I hope it happens before yeah. I, we die also. It is um, it's, it's a really important point. So it's the safety of a patient over settings. You, you may have an elder who has many illnesses, many medicines. They are changed in the hospital. They go to a rehab center. I just discharged a woman yesterday who was going to a rehab center. Then she was going to hospice after the rehab center. And I, I was really skeptical that all that information through three different electronic health systems uh, records was going to continue and be carried through. And it's kind of like telling a circle. And by the time it goes around the circle, the message is really different by the time it goes around the circle. So having some sort of synchronized information system, ma'am? Vulnerability to predators. Yeah. So, what, so the comment was about vulnerability to predators. What are you thinking about? Elder scams, uh -huh. telephone scams, yeah. door to door scams. Even um, predatory caregivers. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people that I work with are trying to find a less expensive income care and that um, nursing student, somebody who's heard about somebody through somebody. Um, so there are people who are not nice out there who take advantage of people who have poor judgment. This fascinating comment about the, the risk of elders face of predators, financial or even physical. Um, if they, they don't have the financial resources to hire kind of premium grade A services, they may actually hire someone who, who they're vulner, more vulnerable to. Um, we face a lot of decisions about when a family has financial, put it to financial exploitation or, an, uh, or someone related to the patient is doing financial exploitation, yet they're helping them stay at home. You know, how do you balance the fact that they're keeping mom at home because they're getting her social security check and they're getting to live in her house? You know, so there are some real ethical kind of quandaries about how you handle the financial issues when, the, you know, if the goal is to keep the patient at home. All right, I'm going to, oh, ma'am, in the orange? Yes, um, what if you have mom and dad in similar situations at the same time? Having two parents at home at the same time. Yeah, so it can be du literally double the physical uh, burden. Um, sometimes there are, there are creative ways of managing that if there's an aid that they can share, um, but it is, it's, an, it's, it's actually um, it's often double the anxiety on the family member. And you have to have the kind of government and service programs that can be supportive of that kind of group, group environment. Okay, I'm going to keep going. This is a challenge, and you don't need to know all the dots, um, but this is basically on the bottom thousands of dollars of Medicare spending per person. So it starts at 3,000 per year, goes up to 8,000 per year. That's kind of an average. This is by state, and all the dots are states. And if you look up, the cheapest state, if you want to cost Medicare the least on average, is in Hawaii. All right, so I guess the warmth and the sun and the mellow life in Hawaii keeps people well. The lowest the hot, most expensive state in the United States, if you're Medicare per person, is Louisiana. All right, so maybe that's Bourbon Street and <laughs> Gumbo. Um, I'm not sure what that is. But if you look at the line, they've actually measured the quality ranking of care. So they have quality metrics. So up the, the left side is quality. And what you can see is that the more you spend per person, the lower the state is ranked on quality of care. That's a challenge. If we spend more per person, and it actually is associated anyway with lower quality uh, results. Pretty, pretty, pretty uh, sobering statistic. So now, so now we're kind of in the valley of my talk, right? We're, we're, we kind of feel all the challenges and all the hardships and all the risks to the patients. And I'm going to try to lift the spirits a little bit and talk about my team. Um, as one example, and there's a lot of different ways of doing this, but this is, I'm just going to give you one example of how the healthcare system, and there's obviously family and social issues we're going to need as well, but how the healthcare system can support folks 
who want to stay at home and families who want to help their elders stay at home. So this is about 20 people who are on our team. We started in 1999 at the Washington Hospital Center after I left um, Hopkins. And um, let's see. Um, the guy right in the middle is George Toller. Some of you may know him. He's a Marylander, Baltimore guy from long ago. He and I met 15, 16 years ago. And he had this kind of concept of, let's not have any, any office. Let's take care of only patients in their homes and create a whole mobile system of care that kind of flips the healthcare system on its head. And so that's what we've done for the last 16 years. There's a lot of wonderful people here. I won't say all their names, but if you look, they're just all smiling. You see the smiles on their faces? I mean, really, I mean, broad, beaming smiles. See, there's people, 21 people, who have worked with very um, poor, sick, um, under-resourced, difficult circumstances in D.C., a lot of wonderful families in D.C. who love the work that we're doing. And many of them have been with us for uh, 10, 12, 15 years. We actually have almost zero turnover, except for when folks leave maybe for marriage or personal reasons, uh, like to Iowa, for example. Rachel went to Iowa, so I'm, I'm mad at her still. <laughs> um, but anyway, people love the work. So from a workforce perspective, this is incredibly fun work. When you have a team that can kind of take care of anything the patient or family may need or may throw at you, and you have a team that can put in place the answer for the problem, it's a lot of fun. But the key is to have a team with all the different disciplines in place and a financial support that allows that team to stay alive over, not literally alive, but you know, business alive. Um, over time. So that's, that's kind of the good news, that you can do this. So this is our mission. Our mission is to promote the health and dignity of frail elders in their homes. And that's a short line, but it's, there's a lot of work that goes into doing that. Um, we do home-based primary care, which kind of emanated out of the VA in the 1970s. Some of you may know the VA, a very progressive kind of approach to care of elders that in the home-based primary care team approach. Our team is similar, but a little bit different than the VA teams. We also do their hospital care, and that's actually somewhat unique to our program in that we think we should take care of people at home, but also wherever they go. And that relates to the information systems and the electronic health records, and if patients go to the hospital and the doctors don't know them and their information isn't there, we are there to kind of make sure that the, the hospital, and we take care of them, we, we stay in control of their care in the hospital. So care across all settings, starting in the home, doing urgent visits in the home. Um, we offer 24-7 kind of phone availability to the doc, and we take care of them in the hospital as well. We started in July 1999. We're in the 16th year of our program right now. We've served about 3,000 elders in DC in, in the zip codes we serve. And right now we have 625 patients in the program. Um, we do mostly um, a, about 40% of DC. We don't go to the west side of Rock Creek Park, which is kind of the fancier, higher income part, and we also don't go the other side of Anacostia River strictly for driving time because one of the big challenges we face is time in the car that's not seeing patients. So I'm going to talk about what is possible. So now we're down to what is possible, right? So here's a lady. This is what is possible with the, what we talked about, dedicated family, this, this team in place in the community, good actually Medicaid resources in DC. Turns out this lady was slightly over income for Medicaid. but but that she has other resources that we brought to bear. So 83-year-old woman, you can read this, who had three strokes eight years ago. She can't express herself clearly, but she can understand. So it's kind of a little form of um, purgatory to be able to understand, but you can't express yourself. So she can just say yes. That's the only word she can say for eight years. She's paralyzed on one side of her body. She's bed bound, literally bed bound. She's too heavy and too paralyzed to be able to really get out of bed. She has atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heartbeat, which led to her strokes. She had colon cancer at the same time as her strokes, and her colon removed, part of her colon removed, diabetes, and she has this really severe hypertrophic kind of thick rash on her right leg. Um, her daughter Pamela retired at the age of 55, so this is current, so she retired at 55 to take care of her mom. She gives 24 7 care. They actually had a fire in the first floor where her mom was. They got her out um, safely. Um, fortunately, I think a dog was barking, and they were able to get mom out of the house. They renovated the, the, the house, and her son Willis helped with that. She is actually over income for Medicaid services. The Medicaid in DC is actually pretty generous, but it's 300% of poverty 
for the Medicaid waiver program. And she was slightly over that, but not enough, as Renee was touching on, um, to, to hire help throughout the day. She has like a lot of home medicines, a lot of home medical equipment. She has hospital beds. They renovated the first floor. They were able to get a three-hour aid on Monday, Wednesday, Friday from the DC Office on Aging. So that's kind of the background. This is what happened over eight years, um, over the, last, the past eight years. She gets 24-7 bedside care from her daughter, from this intermittent aid, and from other family members. She got 120 house calls over about eight years. Medical, mostly medical, because she did not have as much active social work involvement. And about two-thirds of those, or three-quarters, were nurse practitioner visits. And about one, in our program, about one-quarter to one-third of the visits, 30% roughly, are by the doctor. So she had a doc and an NP. She had a lot of medicines uh, adjusted over time. She got home x-rays. She got home labs done. She got home nursing done. She had home PT done, home podiatry. Um, she actually, we have eye doctors who actually will visit the house. Um, but usually, usually not. Um, in eight years, she had one ER visit. And she had been two hospital admissions just in the past four months, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. Her first admission was in May of this year. She had a terrible infection and this rash in her leg. She was getting sicker at home. We decided to bring her to the hospital, thought long and hard about what are the risks of the hospital and what, what are the benefits. Brought her in. She had plastic surgery, debridement, dermatology saw her. She got antibiotics. Remember that. She got antibiotics. And she went home. Right, so that was pretty good use of the hospital. She had another admission last month. Um, she was eating poorly at home for like six weeks. Uh, she had diarrhea, so we decided to actually check her for C. diff colitis, which is a side effect of antibiotics, of the IV antibiotics she got in the hospital. The test came back from home positive. But she was eating so poorly that she started developing deep pressure sores on her backside and her heel, even though she was getting good care from her daughter. And she wasn't taking pills anymore. So she was less verbal, had less oral food. We, just, we talked it over a lot with her daughter between the power of attorney and a very trusted, the tr at this point, eight years in, we had a lot of trust with the family. And trust is probably the key ingredient in terms of making these kind of hard decisions. We decided to bring her for a palliative surgery in the hospital to debris the dead tissue and infected tissue to see if she would feel better and be able to eat and drink. Um, it didn't work. And after about four or five days in the hospital, she declined. She wasn't able to take the antibiotics by mouth that she needed for that C. diff colitis. Um, we changed to comfort care, and we actually had her go to inpatient hospice for caregiver relief. And four days later, she died peacefully at the inpatient hospice. I'm going to just stop there for a minute, you know, because it's eight years of information and three slides. Any questions about the case, about what we did, or about how we did it? Sure. How did you finance that care for routine reimbursement? You know, without fail, that's always the second question. I've been talking about this for 15 years, and without fail, it's always the second question. So the answer is um, the delivery team was financed. So obviously, there's four perspectives when you talk about money in healthcare. There's the patient and the family. There's kind of the providers, like me and my team. There's the maybe the health system or really, well, the health system is kind of part of my, my perspective. There's the, and then there's the payors, the health insurance payors, right? So for our healthcare team, we financed it with, we bill for house calls, so Medicare pays about 100 bucks a house call. Um, and we might make, you know, on average, 15 house calls a year. Um, we actually, in Medicaid patients, we get some funding through Medicaid waiver. So in this case, we did not receive that. Um, that, and then I actually, that gets us to about 75% of our costs, we get reimbursed, that's, we, get, we get enough revenue to reimburse. But we actually operate in the red, under just fee-for-service Medicare. The other 25% for 15 years, we've been passing together grants, some philanthropy, some ho good hospital support. And just right now, at this moment, Medicare is running a demonstration program that may share savings with programs like ours and we're part of that Medicare demonstration program if we show that we reduce total costs. So you can imagine the average cost per year of this patient over eight years with her level of illness usually is at least a couple admissions a year. Um, it's just the average is maybe twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year for a patient like her. She had no admissions in seven years and one year visit. So if we were to receive a share of that savings, that would really fund the program, but that's not happening yet, but it may happen soon. 
Okay. Did I answer your question? Okay. Any other questions about the case, sir? What we used to call aids to daily living, uh, which were picked up by the government at that time. Uh, did the family have to pay out of pocket, and how was that uh, arranged in relationship to the uh, care that you gave? Are you asking about the three-hour aid? Yeah. That she had? That was a D.C. government kind of office on aging uh, item that the D.C. government paid for. So, so it wasn't Medicaid, and it wasn't Medicare. But it was three hours, three times a week, they, they have that program in D.C. That aid is important, and I just want to give another highlight for workforce and the importance of the home health aids. The home health aids are crucial to our care in the home because they offer the first kind of radar warning when something is going wrong. And if they know that we respect and want their feedback and want to hear from them, you know, I think, and we try to do that when we visit our, our, our patients, is make sure the aid knows that their input and their opinion is really valuable because usually we can prevent problems if we engage the aid in, in kind of monitoring things. Any other questions about the case? Okay, so that's kind of what is possible um, over many years if you, if you really put that kind of team together. You know, I just want to list the core services that I think this population needs. If you're going to set up a program, whether it's in Howard County or any other county in the, in the United States, these are the kind of services that you have to think about providing with, from your team. One is home-based primary care. These are patients who have trouble getting out of the home for whom the office is probably the wrong setting of primary care. Because the reason it's wrong is that things deteriorate too fast, and if you go to the home, you can actually get upstream and prevent crises before they happen. If you wait for them to call 911 or call, wait for their appointment in the doctor's office, which might be four or six weeks from now, um, things will crash and they may end up in the hospital you know, and have a bad, have a bad outcome. So home-based primary care and a team that is willing to do that and able and trained. Social work case management. Uh, Jenna, who I pointed out earlier, is one of our ACE social workers. We have four social workers on our team. I don't know of any other, um, I don't know of any other team in the, in the region or even in the country that has that kind of great social work resources on, our, on the medical team in, in the, uh, you know, the home environment. I think the VA provides social services, but not as intensively. And so what we do is we do a lot of intensive social work case management to prevent social work crises, social crises get the aids in place, have Medicaid applications put in, food, nutrition, um, you name it, our social workers do it. One of our social workers actually rode the electric power wheelchair from one hospital over to the place where they had to turn, you know, hand it off where the patient was going to need at the dialysis unit because that's what the patient needed. So whatever the patient needs, our team kind of commits to, to providing. So social work case management, we do a lot of mental health and dementia care. It's just a general area, a lot of both mental health symptoms from dementia as well as just pure dementia care. We do the acute hospital care. We coordinate 24-7 all their medical and social services. So that means when the patient or family are fear afraid or they're nervous or scared about a new symptom, they can call tw one number 24-7, and within 10 minutes, a doc is on the line who knows them, actually who looks at their electronic health record. So our electronic health record goes across settings. And that doc can see what happened to that patient you know, recently and can give them counsel whether they need to come home, come to the hospital, or whether we can see them at home the next day. So that kind of 24-7 coordination. And then we do end-of-life care, because as these folks get more sick, ultimately they uh, uh, kind of enter a terminal phase of their illness. And we talk with them and the family about what their wishes and goals are. And sometimes we do ICU care in the hospital. We have an amazing case that just happened last week where one of our younger patients, 68-year-old with liver failure, massive bleeding from you know, blood vessels in her esophagus and stomach. Um, she nearly died at home. She, they thought she was going to die in the hospital. She got into the hospital center. My partner, Dr. Toller, talked with the family and the specialist, and they did this fancy procedure. They poked a huge catheter through her liver, relieved the pressure on the bleeding, and the bleeding stopped, and she was on the respirator, and we all still thought she was probably going to die talked to the family, they decided to bring her home from the ICU. They, they didn't go to the floor. They said, let's just take her home, because we're not going to do any more procedures on her. And we did send her home with hospice. And a couple of days later, they fired hospice, not because hospice did anything wrong, um, but because you know there was medications they couldn't get through the hospice benefit. And so now she doesn't have, and my NP saw her yesterday, she said she's sitting up in her wheelchair, eating lunch, and actually doing really well, back to her normal, ornery self. So it doesn't mean you don't use the hospital, 
but it, it means you use it very judiciously, very carefully, and as soon as they can get you know, somewhat stable, get them the heck out of the hospital. All right, so those are the core, any questions about the core services? Now that's not all the services they need, but that's the core services we, we provide. Right. Say, say something more about the, the workforce that you rely on to carry out the support services. Okay, so here's a great segue to my next slide. Thank you. So here are the, the kind of core, the, the, the center is the team you saw in the picture, right? The center is our team. It's, it's the medical house call program team, docs, nurse practitioners, social workers, and coordinators. That's the core workforce for our team that that I supervise and I have to find funding for and we have to kind of work, we work with every day. So the workforce of docs is geriatricians, at least on our team, very rare, but we, we try to find geriatricians who are willing to do this kind of work, get outside their comfort zone and go out into the community. Nurse practitioners are kind of one of the heart and soul of our team, actually. We have five nurse practitioners and they tend to be geriatric nurse practitioners who are willing to make house calls. Right, to, right now, they're on the streets of DC all day, every day, making house calls. You need nurse practitioners. Social workers, I mentioned. Um, coordinators are kind of office staff who are good at customer service and good at knowing how to solve problems on the phone when people need meds or equipment or appointments. Or, so that's the core workforce, Ron. Um, and then the other spokes of the wheel. So I see this as kind of the hub is, is this team. And then the other workforce needed, however, is all the other spokes on this wheel. And you can kind of look at those things and realize how much other labor and workforce is needed. The far lower right, for example, home PT and OT, so therapists to do rehab at home. RNs, um, people doing IV therapy, we rarely do, but we can do IV therapy. Hospice nurses. I would put the home health aides in that nursing category. Probably two-thirds of our patients have home health aides of some sort, either private pay or Medicaid-funded home health aides. The pharmacists, the medical equipment company, transport techs and lab techs to do x-rays at home. So you can think, you know, you, to be going to geriatrics, you don't have to become a doc or an NP or a social worker. You can, you can pick any one of these services, and you can kind of be a, a elder care or geriatric workforce specialist. Subspecialist docs, all the inpatient rehab, um, uh, staff, the ER docs and all the nursing and techs and transport in the ER and the hospital. Um, the aides, as I mentioned, um, environmental and legal services, people doing home modification. So when you think about the workforce, if you define broadly for this creating an elder care system, there's a huge um, kind of array of choices, actually, if you want to go into uh, you know, care of elders or geriatrics, other than just the core team. Does that answer your question? Yeah, if you could say a little bit more about where you are finding those workers. Yeah. And our educational institutions like community colleges becoming an increasingly important part of that workforce of thought. I actually think, well, I, I thought it was 40,000, but 30,000 and probably a lot of those in, in healthcare professions. I would imagine Howard County Community College, if we had a program in this county, which I would love to have, um, would be a natural place to look. Um, social work department at Catholic University we look to. Um, actually, we sometimes find people from the home nursing care agencies who are kind of tired of just doing just the, 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 you know, the episodic nursing care and they want to be part of a long-term care team. The home health aides, actually, um, Jenna would, I don't want to have you speak, have to speak in public and put you on the spot, but Jenna, when I ask her that, she often um, will find home health aides when, after a patient dies, the good ones, we find them, and we have another family hire them. Medicaid um, agencies who have their own stable of home health aides, we look, we look to them. The people we, we actually employ are the people in the center of that circle. But all the others are, are kind of um, recruited and trained by some of these other entities. But lo lots, man. Do you ever include dental um, hygienists or dentists in this picture? Yeah, so there's a one mobile dentist service in DC. They do a good job. So we have a mobile dentist, you know, and, and they come out. They can do um, some extractions, some dental hygiene work. And some, actually, you know, the patient I just presented, her only ear visit was because of dental hygiene problems. Well, a lot of problems do stem from the teeth. Yep. The yeah, so her, the, she, her dentures got so caked and kind of cemented to her mouth that she couldn't chew and swallow anymore. So having mobile dental work, and, you know, again, there's financial issues because they tend to be private pay, the mobile dental services. And some of our patients can't afford that. Do um, you know if the mobile dentist pays for by Medicaid? Is Medicaid? Yes, it is Medicaid. Yeah. So, so. Yeah. 
And so Medicaid can't cover some of it. Medicare does not cover dental work. Any other questions about the service? So this is a this slide has a lot covers a lot. Phyllis? How does your team address behavioral health issues? Uh -huh. Great question. So on our core team, the mental health and behavioral health issues are huge. So dementia, maybe 60% of our patients have dementia. Within dementia, there's a lot of behavioral health issues, right? Agitation, confusion, disinhibition, poor judgment, psychotic symptoms, depression, anxiety, you know, tons of mental health and behavioral health issues. We actually hire on our core team for people who know how to manage psychiatric issues. So um, a lot of our core team, Phyllis, actually does the diagnosis and treatment of, without, we're not psychiatrists, but we have a lot of experience taking care of those symptoms. Then we have a psychiatrist who works with our team meeting. Um, we have a social work therapist who actually does counseling for a real kind of patients who are capable of doing uh, psychotherapy. We work with adult protective services in DC for danger or kind of really severe mental illness in families. We're, we have a couple cases right now where it's the child who has severe mental illness and they're putting the patient at risk because of the severe mental illness of the child. And so we, we activate mobile crisis kind of psychiatric units to do imminent kind of risk evaluations of family members. So the mental health and behavior, that's why we kind of put a separate bullet for that on our list of services because that's such a dominant part of, of caring for people at home. Sure do. Um, so we have a lot of folks who have both al alcohol, some narcotics dependence. Um, sometimes we have people who have had chronic pain for many years and become very overly dependent on their oxycodone or their Percocets and we have to have contracts set up with them. Uh, folks who go through withdrawal when they come into the hospital. So you have to really know your patient over time. We, have, we talked about a patient this morning who actually has HIV. So in his 70s, has HIV. He has, he's an alcoholic and we can't find him because whenever we try to make house calls, he's out on the street actually drinking and inebriated. So we have to, our, our social worker literally walks down the street and finds him and brings him back home so that we, we can visit him. So there's no substitute for making a house call. I mean, really, I mean, you go out to the neighborhood and the house, you know why they're either succeeding or failing. Any other questions about this? So the, this is, a, this is a, a very Reader's Digest version of the work that we do every day with the core team and then connecting with all the service partners in your community. You have to find all these folks. You know, they're not all just sitting next to the Washington Hospital Center. You have to go find these partners, see if they're good, see if they're responsive, see if they you know, will provide good care, and then find them in your community. If you can't find them, then you have to build them yourself. So what is possible? So this is kind of just a little bit of the results, and we've got about 15 minutes left, so I'm going to spin through this a little bit. So we, you know, we do a patient survey using the HCAPS, which is this kind of standardized satisfaction. Our patients rate us outstanding satisfaction, 98%, and the other 2% are more kind of um, just below outstanding. Um, so really high satisfaction. They get a lot of dignity from the program um, because we care for them in their own home. I mentioned this a little bit, but as a provider, I feel really deep personal kind of rewards and satisfaction from the, the work that we do and the smiles on the picture of our team, I think, you know, kind of confirm that. Um, it's a chance to be creative. If you, want to have, if you want to have a career where you can be really creative and figure out how to solve problems like finding the guy who's drinking down the street and bringing him back home, you know, so that you can do your visit. Um, creative mobile technology, if you're into technology, doing diagnostic and therapeutic technologies in the home. And doc, Dr. Left runs a program that I would love to have in DC called Hospital at Home, where you do hospital level care in the home. Really creative, right? If we could tap that when my patients got urgently ill instead of bringing them into the hospital, you might have less risk of hospital infections and delirium and functional decline. So a chance to be creative is really gratifying. And we talked about how much fun it is to be on a team that can really handle all the issues that come up. For the health system, it's actually a solution for their problem. Health system's main problem, especially in the near coming future, um, is how do they handle their high cost patients who, who they can't keep out of the hospital? Because pretty soon they're gonna be paid not based on how many times the patient comes into the hospital, but how well they take care of that patient outside and how, how much cost they prevent. And for society, it's really comes down to just better care to be in the home and do mobile care. It's less caregiver burden if you can help relieve some of the stresses that the caregivers feel figure out how to get aides to support them in the home, be available 24-7 when they're scared or they need help. 
and this gets to kind of the rub of the financial issue, which we always need to talk about. Depending on which program you look at, um, the VA has really great data. We just published some data, which I'm going to go over. There's probably 15 to 20 percent. That's conservative. That there's probably 15 to 20 percent of the Medicare budget on this subgroup. Remember, they're 5 percent, but they expend 50 percent of the budget on this subgroup. Probably 15 to 20 percent that's harmful or waste, wasted in the Medicare budget. So there's plenty of money. If you want other message, you can take away. There's plenty of money in the Medicare Medicaid budget if you actually change the setting of care. All right, so here's a, thing, a study we were just able to publish. It took like four years of getting data from Medicare, finding someone smarter than me to analyze the data and look at 722 cases of our patients. We found 2,160 control patients, meaning they, did, they were not in our program. They were getting usual care, but they were from the same socioeconomic, medical, age, gender, race, um, kind of type of patients as us. So we found patients very similar who were just getting usual care. High mortality rate in both groups, 36 to 40 percent mortality rate over average two years in the study. But our team changes how we utilize health care. That's another bottom line of the talk. The, our cases had 105 percent more generalist primary care visits, 100 percent Increased use of hospice. It doesn't mean 100% used hospice. I'm kind of worried that that's the message it says. But it was an increase. So when our patients were near the end of life, like about twice as many when they were dying were enrolled in hospice. 23% less specialist visits and 20% fewer hospital admissions. That number 20%, that's kind of the magic number. Because basically what drives Medicare is hospital admissions. What drives total cost is hospital admissions. So if you have a team that can prevent hospital admissions, unnecessary ones, right? Um, you generally get to this roughly this 20% number. Okay, so what's the bottom line from the study? It's total cost, we dropped the rate on our patients compared to the controls by 17%. It came out to about $8,400 over two years. Um, and when you then kind of do a thought experiment, where you say, okay, if you were to provide this kind of care to everyone in the country who needed it, not all of Medicare patients, but so 5% of Medicare is 2 million. So we're not going to probably get this to 2 million people. But 1 to 2 million need this kind of care. You say $4,000 on average, conservatively, per year, per patient. Um, you could save in the ballpark of 4 to $8 billion. You know, and so you probably saw the Democrat and Republican acrimony in Washington. If you could say, here's four to eight billion dollars per year, and you can apply that to whatever budget deficit you want or whatever Medicare kind of you know, resources, you can actually get a fair amount of funding. This would require replication of this model right in every county around the United States. So we're not saving this much right now. But that 15 to 20 percent on Medicare is, is kind of the magic number. The VA has had very similar numbers with their home-based primary care program, ranging from like, on some studies, 24% or as low as 13%. All right, so this is kind of what it takes to get back to this gentleman's question. Actually, it's expensive to run one of these teams. We have 20 people, roughly 10 people on each team. We have a red team and a blue team. It costs about a million dollars per team for the staffing, just to pay modest, in, modest salaries to this, you know, all 10 people. And the docs make more than you know, the NPs, but the docs don't make near as much as a lot of other docs make. Um, there's low Medicare fee-for-service payments that do not cover the full cost of the program. Just to give you a, a little ballpark, an eight-hour private aid, which Renee was touching on earlier, costs about $3,400 a month. If you want to hire an aide and pay you know, 14 bucks an hour to a private aid, it costs about $3,400 a month if you don't qualify for Medicaid. So that's, a, that's a lot of money, right? That's higher than a lot of seniors others in, uh, monthly incomes. There's actually a low workforce to get to Ron's point in some of these disciplines. Some disciplines, there's a lot of actually great workforce out there. I find that when we need to recruit social work or NPs, it's actually a lot easier to find them. It's not that um, it's, it's hard for NPs and social workers to necessarily find jobs, but the docs are hard to find. Um, and some of the other kind of mobile, more medical providers are hard, are hard, hard to find. Um, this, this touches on that New York Times article, but in some states, including D.C., you lose your Medicaid aids if you enroll in hospice. Actually, it was in all the letters to the editor yesterday, yesterday before on the New York Times were kind of about that, how crazy that is, that 
this, this patient couldn't go home in New York because he wouldn't have his Medicaid A's if he enrolled in hospice. Just kind of different bureaucracies with different rules, um, not allowing the patient to go home. So this is what I think it takes, again, to kind of start to close on a big picture. I think we have to actually really promote a culture of what I call honesty, where we embrace the aging process, embrace the fact that some of it's not pretty, and some of it's hard, and that people do die. And we have to kind of help at that stage of life, as well as kind of all the years before that. There needs to be devoted family or AIDS or some combination of the two. Um, you need to, I think, have skilled mobile teams um, that can actually do the hard work every day, 24-7 availability, you know, to kind of manage ups and downs of people with multiple serious illnesses. You need to kind of try to switch on a policy level to some positive incentives for home-based care. Um, and that then would guide patients and their families to, to lower risk, usually preferred, lower cost settings. It's usually the home. And then once you kind of have that shift where there's a, you tip kind of the financial and cultural kind of goals towards home-based care, then you realize that the workforce needs are going to be even greater. Because there are going to be a lot more folks who, who want to, to participate. What does it take? So this is a patient I saw yesterday. Um, this is a 98-year-old who lives uh, you know, just over on like 14th Street, Northeast uh, DC. She's on the right. Her name's Maddie. Um, this is her daughter, who just turned 65. On the left, her name is Janice. Um, Ms. Maddie was, um, I met her three years ago. She came home from the hospital nonverbal after a stroke from atrial fibrillation. Another patient had a bad stroke. She had a feeding tube in her stomach. She wasn't talking. Um, and over time, with our team's visits, uh, we removed the feeding tube, and now she's kind of eating ice cream and whatever she wants. She kind of improved. We stopped some of her medications because stopping medicines is probably more important or as important as starting medicines in older folks. She woke up more, she became less confused. Her stroke recovered some, her brain healed. Even when at 96, your brain can heal from, to some degree from a stroke. She's still paralyzed on her right side of her body. If you look closely, her right hand, which is over top of her left hand, her right hand is real puffy and swollen, you see that? That's total paralysis of her right side. Um, her daughter has her set up in a hospital bed on the first floor, so renovated you know, the whole first floor. So this is a sacrifice that the daughter is making so that mom can be at home. That's the most powerful um, kind of contributor in this case. But we've, we've, we've helped. Um, so as of yesterday, she was awake. She was saying a few words. She said, the daughter said she gets really mad at me because she keeps telling me what she wants, and she can't find all the words for that. So when I, I have to keep guessing. So the daughter keeps guessing what she wants. And when she hits it, you know, the, the patient kind of gives her a high five and says, that's, that's what I wanted. So she can understand and comprehend. So you have to realize, she looks like she might be confused or not with it, but she comprehends everything that's going on. And she's having actually, as you can see, a very affectionate, you know, loving environment. So that's really what it takes. So there's good news. I actually think there's really growing interest. I've just been feeling it in the past year, maybe 18 months. There's a lot more interest in the media, um, actually in my population in DC, and kind of aging, end of life care decisions. Maybe we shouldn't be making people suffer so much when they're near the end of life. Payers are starting to shift to paying for more results, and not as much just how many times can they see the patient. Large health systems are getting more interested in kind of putting resources into population health, which means serving you know, the higher risk patients in the community. And there's actually some innovative ideas. I'm going to mention one from Hopkins, if I have a couple minutes, um, to recruit and train new workforce. We talked about the potential for savings to Medicare. I'm going to mention the Independence at Home Act, which is the Medicare demo that is ongoing right now that would share savings with providers if they reduce the cost of care below what's expected. That would be a, a sea change of how you pay for health care. That if you reduce costs on your population, you get to keep, in our case, 80% of the savings. That would be pretty cool. All right, so this is a quick study from Hopkins that you should know that's just going on, done by uh, uh, some colleagues of Bruce and mine. It basically, the highlight is the first two bullets. It's a multi, they, they identified there's a multifactorial cause for disability. There's lots of things that cause disability. Cognitive, psychiatric, physical, you know, uh, 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 you know, deficits. So you need to have a multi-component intervention. And they call it capable, 
community aging in place, advancing better living for elders. And they basically picked three. They didn't do. They didn't do the whole team we had. They picked three other team team members who we actually don't have on our daily team. And they're going to do a OT, occupational therapy, nurse, and handyman services. The client and the family identified these are the three biggest problems I have at home. Not identified by the healthcare team. And then they, they try to put in place all the abilities that they might have to solve that, that problem, whether it's activities of daily living, meds, home safety, fall risk. And they're going to try to see if that helps people stay safer and longer at home. So some next steps. So I'm going to close with next steps. There's a cultural change in public education. That's part of why I'm here, um, is to try to really highlight that we can keep elders at home. As we talked about at lunch, keeping the elders at the center of our community. Um, there's great benefits to that, both to them and to families, to young people, and to society from a kind of a, um, a financial perspective. We need to try to change the incentives on a policy level to focus on really rewarding teams that produce good results, both quality and then financial savings. I'm just going to mention a couple options. You know, in Maryland, there's this new waiver that, from CMS that will essentially cap the cost that uh, money that hospitals can receive from Medicare over the course of a year. And if they come in over budget, they don't get any more. So all of a sudden, the hospitals in Maryland are now very motivated to actually prevent high cost events instead of admit people. They're kind of feeling schizophrenic because up until January, they were trying to admit as many people as possible. And now they're trying to prevent as many admissions as possible. So I'm really curious to see how your own hospital would do with that. You could get a per member per month. And I actually think private pay, higher income people, would pay more privately, private monthly fees for this kind of team-based care. But to figure out how to do that, to make it a scalable business model. So ultimately, we need to make a business model, because you have to have money at the end of the year to hire new people. But if you don't have money at the end of the year to hire new people, it's just going to stay in Washington, D.C. with grants and philanthropy kind of helping us you know, stay, stay alive. And then you can recruit workforce for all these different places. I'm going to just mention, because I'm at the end of my time, uh, I've got like two minutes. This is a 111-year-old, just so you know. She actually graduated from hospice twice. <laughs> she graduated at the age of 106 and then at 110. She had a stroke at home. We care for her at home with her stroke. She didn't, you don't need a CAT scan wherever you have a stroke. You know, she had a stroke. We knew she had a stroke. She, didn't, she wasn't swallowing. After a couple of days, she started swallowing, and she just stayed at home at age 110. She was sewing and cooking until the age of 109. Her daughter died in the room next door at age 85. She had 16-hour age through the Medicaid waiver program. DC has a great Medicaid waiver program to prevent nursing home placement. And the aide, don't tell anyone this, the aide actually stayed overnight with her when she was off duty, so that she wouldn't be alone. But that's not allowed. <laughs> so she didn't really do that. Um, after seven years of our care at home, she had about 90 house calls. She was in the hospital once in that first episode of sepsis. But then the last six years of her life, she had no ER visits, no hospital admissions. She had all the needed diagnostic and treatments at home. She had a guardianship set up by one of our social workers when she was 109, because there wasn't any daughter anymore, so she needed a guardian. And she died peacefully at home. And they called me when she died, and they let me come out and say goodbye to her. So these are my five questions. I'm not going to repeat them. I hope we answer them together. Um, and I'm going to close by encouraging you to read Atul Gawande's piece from Sunday in the New York Times, the best possible day you can get for your elder. Um, I have copies of it up here, but the link is on the last slide. Essentially, his son, his daughter's piano teacher was dying of cancer. And he, he's learning about palliative and end-of-life care. He's a surgeon, but he's writing a book, just came out today, actually, um, called Being Mortal, M-O-R-T-A-L, where he wants our culture to kind of face the fact that we are mortal. Um, and that he talked about how do you get the best possible day for your loved one? So he helped his friend, his piano teacher, come home from the hospital and get enrolled in hospice. She, started, she wanted to resume teaching. That would be her best possible day she could imagine, teaching the, his 13-year-old and others. Um, she taught from a hospital bed in the living room. They rearranged the, the hospital floor, I mean the, the first floor. Hospice and AIDS were in place. They would give her pain medicine because she had bad cancer so that she could not be in pain when she was teaching. Um, her students returned for their final lessons. And they gave a concert in her living room with Brahms and Chopin and Beethoven. And then she died a couple weeks later. 
And I don't know if Paul will do. I'm gonna I'm gonna read this because you can't see see this. This is, he always ends with a joke, right? So this is a, an elderly man on a table with a doctor kind of staring at him. He says, "I would embrace the aging process if I could lift my arm." So I think we can all try to embrace and lift our arms and embrace that process. Thank you.